Welcome to Straight Scripture, No Sugar. This is a Bible series dedicated exclusively to the Word of God. John 17, 17 says, Father, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. In Matthew 5, 18, Jesus says, Not one jot or tittle will pass until all of the law is fulfilled. 2 Timothy 3, 16, All of Scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training so every man may be perfect and complete and equipped for every good work. So that's why here you're going to get straight scripture, no sugar, directly from the Word of God, so you know what the truth is, free of human error. So today's topic is think above, think above. So this is a topic uh, that directly piggybacks really on the last sermon I did, which is Christian discipline. So there's definitely some overlap here and some scripture overlap, but some different details are going to be explored in some of these scriptures. But basically, this is the mission of the Christian. And thinking above isn't about thinking on some nebulous uh, product of your own imagination or thinking about angels flying around on harps or pixies or whatever goes through your mind. No, no, it's very, very specific. And when Paul says, set your mind on things above, not things of the earth, he's talking about something very specific. And that's actually the first scripture, so let's go to it right now. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. Colossians 3.2 So what Paul's talking about is he's talking about the kingdom of God and all it entails. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the Word. Obviously the Word is your beacon and your bedrock. The Word is your compass that helps you set your mind on things above. So it's very, very specific. It's not some nebulous nonsense that you conjure up in your own mind. It's, it's the kingdom of God and all it entails and all that it entails is basically uh, put forth in the Word of God. So let's look at another scripture here that kind of uh, brings some clarity to this. <clears throat> and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Romans 12, 2. Okay. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, okay? Well, how do you renew your mind? How do you test what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect? Just by conjuring up something in your own imagination? No. The will of God is in the Word of God. You know, Jesus says very clearly, Not everyone who calls me Lord will enter the kingdom, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven, Matthew 7.21. Um, so we need to do God's will, but how do we know what God's will is? Once again, it's not this nebulous nonsense. It's in the Word of God. And Jesus makes it very clear here. So let's go to the next verse. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8, 31 and 32. Okay, you abide in his word. You'll know the truth and it'll make you free. So what does that mean? That you don't have any trouble and you don't have any problems? No. It means it frees your mind from error and confusion. Jeremiah 10.23 says, O oh Lord, I know it is not in a man to know his way. You know, people do not innately know what's right and know what's acceptable and know what's true and know what's pure. No. They're fallen. We're all fallen and we're all driven by our own lusts until we're saved. And then if we get into the Word of God, we will find the true direction. We will be sanctified in truth, like I said in the in introduction there, John 17, 17. So we have to abide in God's Word. So when Paul talks about set your mind on things above, not things of the earth, he's talking about the kingdom of God, which is accessed through the Word, directly. So although we're talking specifically about the Word and using the Word to direct our lives, that's what it is to think above. So it sounds like something nebulous, but it's very, very practical, and it has a very practical application in the life of the believer. You set your mind on things above by setting it on the Word, and then God will elevate you to things above. Okay, so Jesus knows people worry about their financial situation and, and their basic needs, and obviously when he was on earth, um, in occupied Palestine at the time, and that was a very arid agrarian culture, and there were famines, and you know, just the basics of life, just getting food and shelter and water was not easy, was not difficult. But 
I mean, it was difficult. <laughs> what am I saying? It was difficult and it was a strain. Every day was a battle for bread. So um, he's basically in Matthew 6 here, the Sermon on the Mount is Matthew 5, 6, and 7. He addresses the concerns of the believers who feel like they're not going to have enough, who have their mind on things of the earth, so to speak. So I'm going to go to Matthew 6 here, starting in verse 31. Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Matthew 6, verses 31 to 34. All right, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? The Gentiles seek after these things. You're not supposed to worry about that. You're supposed to be focused on seeking the kingdom and his righteousness. And where do you get that direction? Where do you get you know, that compass for seeking the kingdom and his righteousness. What did we just talk about? In his word. That's what gives you the navigational focus to set your mind on things above. Um, so Jesus says, look, you know, don't worry about what you eat, what you drink, or what you wear. The Father knows you need these things. Seek the kingdom and his righteousness, and these things shall be added to you. God will take care of those things. He doesn't want you worried about, oh, uh, my finances, or oh, uh, my job, what if I lose my job, or oh, my children are rebellious, or oh, uh, what if my car breaks down, or oh, what if somebody steals my identity on the internet? He doesn't want you focused on those things. He wants you focused on seeking the kingdom and his righteousness. That's the way the world is. You know, the Gentiles seek after these things. So, you know, here he's talking about literally, you know, food and drink and clothing, the basics of life. But you can extend that to the way all unbelievers think, because Everything is really an extension of that, right? The bank goes under, I'm not going to have any money. I'm not going to be able to buy any, buy any food or clothing. Uh, if I lose my job, I'm not going to be able to support myself. I'm going to be on the street. Uh, if my kids rebel and end up in prison, you know, then it's going to destroy my name and reputation and I'm going to lose my job or whatever, you know. It's just keeping your mind on the kingdom. God will take care of those things. Don't, don't worry about that stuff. We're not here to be eating machines. Um, we're here to serve God, and we're here to serve and advance the kingdom, share the gospel, build people up in the word. So that gets to um, the next scripture here. You know, we have a mission to advance the kingdom of God. Now, there are other things that the scripture talks about as well, and it's amazing how it's such a practical, everyday guide for life. And I did another sermon on this, which is Life as an Owner's Manual. The Bible talks about everything, everything. It talks about work. It talks about family relationships. It talks about the marital relationship. It talks about the relationship between parents and children. It talks about worship. It talks about how we're supposed to elect pastors. It talks about how we battle sin, how we buffet our body. I mean, scripture after scripture after scripture. I mean, 1 Corinthians 9.27 is one example. When Paul talks about, I buffet my body so as to not disqualify myself. I mean, Paul didn't want his witness to be tarnished by his own sin, so what did he do? He battled his body and, and pushed it back into submission. Right? <clears throat> Ephesians 5 talks about the relationship between husband and wife. It's a picture of the relationship of Jesus Christ and the church. Wives submit to your husbands. Husbands love your wives. Uh, well, love your wives, just as Jesus Christ loved the church and gave his life for it. Um, there's more. And also in Ephesians 6 talks about the relationship between parents and children. Children obey your parents. Parents don't uh, provoke your children. And it goes on and on. And all, it, all of it's so practical when it talks about work. Work is always talked about. Uh, in terms of diligent, the plans of the diligently to great abundance, he who is hasty creates only poverty, Proverbs 21.5. But it also says in Proverbs 23.4, do not overwork to become rich, have understanding and cease. So not only does it talk about the nature of work, but it talks about the limits and boundaries of work. We're supposed to have one day to rest, as it talks about, uh, about the Sabbath, rest for one day. Um, so, but the other direction uh, scripture provides, this is how we uh, seek the kingdom and, the, and his righteousness, we serve. So this is in Ephesians 4 here. He himself gave, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to a measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Ephesians 4, 
11 to 13. Okay, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers. Okay, we all have a role in the kingdom to advance the kingdom. To equip the saints, you know, we're supposed to have the, these uh, spiritual gifts, and we do have them when we're saved, and we're supposed to build each other up till we come to the fullness of the knowledge of Christ. We become Christ-like. It talks about also in Romans 8.28. Um, all things work together for the good of those who love God who are called according to His purpose. For who we foreknow, who we foreknow, He predestined to conform to the image of the Son. We're supposed to become like Christ, and we achieve the fullness of Christ by using our spiritual gifts: apostles, pastors, evangelists, teachers. Um, <clears throat> so we all have those gifts, and we're supposed to use them. It also talks about them in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12. I'm not going to get into what all of them are. But we all have these spiritual gifts, and, and we're supposed to use them to serve and build up the body until we come to the fullness of Christ. So that's that's our mission. And, um, you know, for example, some people have the gift of giving. Some people have the gift of encouragement. And these are talked about in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12. Um, some have the gift of prophecy, which means speaking. Um, so we're supposed to use those to build up the kingdom. Um, but that's one of our spiritual duties, and that's what it means to think above, you know. Get on with what you're supposed to do. Everything in this world is fading away. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. 1 John 2, 15-17. You can't hold on to anything in this world. But, as I said in the beginning, not one jot or tittle will pass till all the law is fulfilled. You know, the work of God, the word of God abides forever. So that's what we need to focus on. Don't worry about the mundane everything. God will take care of that. He doesn't want us here to just be eating machines and die. We're supposed to serve. Okay, so I want to get back to uh, Matthew 6, a few verses earlier. Um, um, this is the same verse, or series of verses that's attached to the food and drink and the clothing verse uh, verses. It's a few verses earlier, but I want to add some more depth, so I'm going to talk about this one here. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than the lilies of the field? Um, oh, I'm sorry. Let me go back. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not more, much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Matthew 6, verses 25 to 30. Now think, okay, think about that, the birds of the air and the, fl and the grasses of the field, you know. I mean, think of the flowers, wild flowers, you know. Here Jesus is talking about lilies. Those things have a color and texture that can never, ever be reproduced by any human being on any kind of text, in any textile mill with any kind of um, weaving machine, or I don't know what they're called, but, you know, there's a texture and there's a beauty and there's a color there that that man cannot reproduce. <clears throat> think about it. Not in all his glory was Solomon arrayed as one of these. And you think about King Solomon was the wealthiest man who ever lived. He had an annual income of 25 tons of gold. That's like Donald Trump times 20. You know, and he never had anything that was so beautiful. This is the lily that adorns the grass of the field. Nothing like that could Solomon ever match. The wealthiest man ever. Okay. He also talks about the birds of the air, or the birds of the air, you know. They don't gather in the barns, you know. Think about the birds of the air. I mean, do you ever, ever see a sick bird or a bird that doesn't have enough or a bird that's flying around, you know, chirping half-heartedly? Chirp. Chirp. And it's kind of flying with one wing and barely making it to the tree branch and then almost falling off when it gets there, that doesn't exist. That's amazing. That doesn't exist. You know, so when Jesus says he provides for the bird, birds of the air, 
You know, there's assumption there, too. I mean, think about it. He provides lavishly for the birds of the air. He provides so much. I mean, they go get their food. They do the work, but they have so much energy. I mean, they're up at dawn. I mean, they basically greet the day. I mean, talk about divine presence right there. Every day starts with those birds chirping as soon as the sun comes up, and they are vigorous. They are vigorous. They are flying around. They have tons of energy. Chirp, 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 chirp. I mean, they go nuts. They have a ton of energy. They have more than what's necessary. You know, God provides for them lavishly. And we get back to the grasses of the field, the lilies of the field. God makes the grasses of the field look beautiful. And these things have no spiritual value, nothing. And that's Jesus' point. That was a way of Jewish reasoning, arguing from the lesser to the greater. If God does this for things that have no spiritual value and things that don't advance the kingdom, you think he's not going to give you food and and bread and shelter, you know, that's absurd. That's absurd. That is absolutely ridiculous. Um, okay, so I want to go to another verse here from Matthew 16. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Matthew 16, 24 to 25. Okay, so self-denial is obviously part of the Christian walk. Pick up your cross and follow me. So the cross was an instrument of death in the Roman Empire. That's how the Romans crucified criminals, making a public display of them and humiliating them in public. And that's how Jesus died, to pay the penalty for sins for all believers. Um, but, <clears throat> you know, yes, you may have to die as a Christian witness. Um, but self-denial, that's a really big point. This is not only about salvation, but it's about sanctification. It's about having a life that is productive for God. It's not just about salvation. You know, deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me. He who desires to save his life will lose it. He who loses his life for my sake will save it. So, desiring to save your life is like, oh, well, I got all my ducks in a row, and I got money in the bank, and I got all these hedge funds and IRAs, and, and everything is tucked away, and the job's going well, and, and my family's secure, and blah, blah, blah. Then what if you die in a car accident the next morning? Then what? Then what? Then what's going to happen? You know, and Jesus talks about this in the parable of the rich fool in Luke 12, this man who gathered up all of his uh, agrarian surplus in barns and then tore the barns down and built more and more barns so he could have more and more and more so he could live a life of leisure. And Jesus says, you fool, today your soul is required of you. Who's going to get your goods now? You don't know when you're going to die. The purpose of your life is to serve God, not to amass fortunes and build up hedges. Now, it doesn't mean you shouldn't save. It doesn't mean you shouldn't plan. But that should not be uh, where your mind is. Your mind should be on things above, not the things of the earth. Um, <clears throat> so Paul has a very nice terse statement in Romans 8 I want to talk about here that kind of hits the nail on the head. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, Romans 8, 6. Okay, so there's a reason Jesus says, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you, not as the world gives do I give. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be dismayed. Um, that's in John 14, 27. So Jesus is talking about supernatural peace, and that's exactly what Paul is addressing here, Romans 8, 6, right? Life and peace to be spiritually minded. You know, focus on the kingdom. Focus on God's word. Uh, my God will supply all your needs according to the riches of His glory in Christ Jesus. You know, that's another one, Philippians 4.19. Um, so yeah, you just focus on the kingdom. Be spiritually minded. Focus on the Spirit, okay? So let's see what the ministry of the Spirit is or the fruit of the Spirit is. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Galatians 5, verses 22 to 23. So if you're focused on the Spirit, that's what is going to define your life. Love, joy, peace, hope, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, all those things. And what will bring those things out is living a life where you abide in the Word. If you're in the Word, all those things are going to automatically come out in your behavior. As a man thinks in his heart, so he is, right? Proverbs 23, 7. So if you have the truth, you have God's Spirit in your heart, and you have the direction of the Word, <clears throat> You're going to have this life of love, joy, peace, hope, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. doesn't mean you're going to see all those qualities perfectly because we still battle with sin, but you're going to see an, an increase and a growth in those qualities. Um, 
and a dissipation of sin in your life. Uh, so I want to go finish with one more verse about how we're supposed to be focused on things above by having our hearts and minds in the Word. Now this goes back to the Old Testament from Psalm 119. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. That's Psalm 119.97, and then followed by verse 99. It's my meditation all the day. Now this psalm, um, there's some debate over who wrote it. Some people think Daniel wrote it. Some people think Ezra wrote it. Some people think uh, um, David wrote it. But those were, they're all men of God, and, and meditating on your law, you know, that's, that's what you're supposed to do. That's how you get your mind on things above and off of things of the earth. You know, Psalm 19.7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. That kind of gets back to Romans 12.2, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So all the direction you need to get your mind on things above is in the Word there. It gives you all the guidance that you need. It also guides you through suffering and difficulty and adversity. I didn't really touch on that here, but um, I touched on that in another sermon, Successful Suffering. So that's one that uh, you might want to check out as well. But that's essentially how you think on things above. Get your mind in the Word. That'll give you direction for service, for guidance guidance for every aspect of life, for your finances, for your job, for your family relationships, for your service, everything. So think above, not on things of the earth. So I just want to finish with one gospel sermon, which basically says, all have sinned and all fall short of God's glory, Romans 3.23. Uh, there is not one righteous, not one, not one who understands or seeks after God. That's Romans 3.10. So in our natural state, we're all rebels against God. We all uh, have the remnants of original sin that we inherited from Adam and Eve through the fall in the garden. So, you know, anybody who's being honest with themselves knows this because it says in Romans 2, God gave us all a conscience. You know, we all have a conscience and we all innately know right from wrong. So if you've ever lied, cheated, cheated stolen anything, lusted after somebody's friend or somebody's car, house, or wife, you're guilty of sin. We're all guilty of that. Um, but there is... Uh, an opportunity for restitution and for our, us to be one with God and to escape an eternity of torment, which is through Christ. Why is that? Well, 2 Corinthians 5.21, For our sake he made the man who knew no sin to become sin for us, so in him we might become the righteousness of God. So Jesus pays the penalty for all of the sins of believing humanity before and after the cross. And because of that, we're seen as righteous by God. That restores the relationship. That is reconciliation. Jesus is reconciliation. And how do we get there? Well, Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the, jet, from the dead, you will be saved. So that's how you do it. <clears throat> you confess Jesus is Lord. Now, you hear in churches all the time, if you confess Jesus as your Savior, it's like, no, he's got to be your Lord. That means a life of obedience. That means the direction of a life of obedience. You can't just call him your Savior and then live any way you want. That's living under delusion. That's exactly what Jesus says in Matthew 7, 21. Not, anyone, not everyone who calls me Lord will enter the kingdom, but only the one who does the will of my Father. So how can you follow the righteous path? How can you do the will of God? Well, when you confess Jesus is Lord and it's sincere within your heart, He gives you the Holy Spirit. And there's a great, great revelation of this indwelling Holy Spirit in Ezekiel 36, 26. He says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit, and I will put my spirit in you, and I will move you to keep my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. So basically, if you confess Christ as Lord, it's a sincere confession. He gives you the Holy Spirit, which guides you and empowers you to obey. So anyway, this has been Straight Scripture, No Sugar. My name is John Parisi. This is just one sermon in an entire series of sermons. You can check out at GetBible, uh, GetBibleTruth.com, so I'll, I hope you'll do so. And I hope this has been an edifying force in the life of believers, and it gives unbelievers a chance to confess Christ. And I say thank you for listening. God bless you. Amen.